Hi guys, it's Maggie Bot here to do another video review. Today's video will be for Spirium or Spirium. This is a William Adia game from this year, 2013, and I picked it up the other day at the shop. William Adia is most famous for one of my all-time favorite games called Kalis, and let's just say he hasn't really been prolific since then. He made Kalis Magna Carta, the card game, and really that's about it. So I'm really excited to have been able to kind of dive into something else that he had had his hands on. Um, it did come along with this lovely kind of steam, steampunk veneer, and so that's all well and good. I've actually enjoyed a couple of the steampunk games that came out this year, which I was kind of surprised because it feels a little hokey to be on that bandwagon. But we're going to be looking through all the fun bits that come with this pretty mean little card game. Spirium runs from 2 to 5 players about, I want to say, 30 to 45 minutes, and you could probably teach down to about 9 or 10, uh, as long as they're a little mean-spirited. It has a major Scrooge factor. So let's look at the components, dive right in, and then we'll come back and talk about what I thought about it. Thanks. The game of Spearium is played over six rounds, players taking turns placing meeples onto a board filled with cards, and then taking turns removing them to take effects. So as you can see here we have the board. This is made up of players' tokens being either in the first phase or in the second. In the first phase you can place meeples out into the board in between cards. There's no restriction for the number of meeples that can be present, and if you already have meeples, you can still add extras. You can also take advantage of that event of that round, either during the first phase or the second, so there's no restriction on that. And the event can be taken one per player playing, so you'll also have a token down at the bottom of the board to signify whether or not you've used that. So in this case, it's converting our Spirium resource into pounds, either one for three or three for six. So all the players will have access to that. It's just really a matter of when. And you'll also see here there's an income track in the middle. It goes from two through five, and then it jumps to seven. Before the first phase of each of the six rounds, you will take a number of money equal to wherever your token is here. So there's going to be plenty of opportunities to gain more income as you play. And then we have our card scheme here. As you can see, this is a 3x3. Three three. It comprises of a random assortment of characters, buildings, and technologies. We've shuffled the three decks that are backed A, B, and C separately, and the first three rounds will be played in deck A. The second, the third and fourth round will be played in, in the B deck, and the last round will be the C deck, which is mostly victory points and things to spend extra money no resources in this game are worth anything at the end unless you have a card that says so. So having extra money or Spirium lying around isn't worth anything unless you've built an engine for it. So when it comes to the turns, the first phase is merely placing your meeples out onto the board. And by no means do you have to place all of your meeples. Right now the green player has three meeples to place but maybe they don't want to, so after they're done placing their second meeple, when it becomes their turn again, they're going to switch from the first phase into the second and start taking actions immediately. So that means in this game that if you're still placing meeples out onto the board, people can affect the board state before you have a chance to get there. So what do I do when I want to take an action? You have a few different options. One of the most crucial effects in this game is knowing when to purchase a card and when to hold back and wait and see if you can't do something else. So the first thing you can do when you remove a meeple from the board is choose an adjacent card and take one money for every meeple still adjacent to that card. So if we choose here, you can take three money from the bank and you put this meeple away and make sure you keep your unplaced meeples and your meeples removed from the board separately because you may be able to use your unplaced meeples in the second phase. So green is 
gained three money. So let's assume that blue will now also pass and would like to take an action. When removing a meeple, you can choose a card adjacent on either side and purchase that card. So blue has decided they'd like to purchase this card. Once they've built it, it's going to give them another meeple that they can immediately use to pay for costs and they'll be able to use it in the next round to place onto the board. This one gives you three victory points at the end and costs five pounds. But wait, it costs five pounds plus one for each meeple still adjacent to the card when I want to buy it. So the cost of buying this card for blue from lifting up here is actually seven pounds. And then this goes onto their board and they immediately take another blue meeple from the bank and it goes onto their player card. Now we've limited the options for the meeples still behind for green and blue. So if green had to have their eye on that building, they're now not able to get it anymore. If a meeple is left surrounded by no cards, there is no real action that they can take, but they do need to take an action of nothing, kind of fizzles, and that is a huge advantage for the other players. So that's for buildings. Next we have character cards. Character cards will generally have a payment for a benefit. This one has pounds for an increase in income. So once we've put the tokens on there at the beginning of the round, these will tell you how many pounds that's going to cost. So if there are multiple tokens, players, when they activate an ability, they can choose which token they'd like to pay for. Obviously, in this case, a lower income or a lower amount of money for the income is probably better. So green is going to remove their meeple, and they've decided to take that income. So it would cost two pounds, plus any meeples that are left over around this character, so that's one more. It's going to cost them three, and it's going to pay for itself because that'll push their income up to three for the next round. The token then goes back face down into the pool and will be used for future cards. The other type of effect that you can take is for these patented technologies. So each one will have a very powerful benefit. This one allows you, when you tap a specific kind of building, to gain an extra victory point and victory points at the end of the game for buildings of that type. The cost is six pounds and again you're going to check once you've removed your meeple for any meeple still adjacent. This one has zero, so it only costs them six pounds. Now, technologies are not like buildings. You can have as many of them as you want, and there is no building cost for them. There's no filing fee, or whatever you want to call it for the theme. You just place that to the left of your player card, and it becomes a permanent part of their player board. That could be a lot of points at the end of the game, and it's also going to flavor a lot of what you do for the rest of this game. So, this meeple is next to this character card with zero tokens left on it. So, blue doesn't have a valid last action to take. So, they must remove their meeple. You cannot pass when you still have meeples out on the board. And just call it a wash. Now, some cards, once built, require meeples to get their benefits. This one requires a meeple and a spirium for four victory points. That's when the unplaced meeples from the first phase come into play. So if you have meeples left over that you didn't place out onto the board for benefits, you'll be able to use them to pay for buildings. Buildings are only used in the second round, but they can take place any time you can take those actions in any order you like. So you could take a building action without removing a meeple, or you can save them all for the end once all your meeples have been taken off the board. One kind of cool aspect of this game is that if you do come up with some early game victory points, as you pass both 8 and 20, there will be a small benefit. So characters are given these little reminder tokens that when they pass eight victory points, they can choose either to take another worker or five money from the bank. And when they get to 20, they're going to take the other benefit. So if they took the money, they'll take the meeple at 20. 
So this gives you a huge advantage and some incentive to get early game victory points in a type of game where that's not always ideal. So in between rounds, your setup is pretty easy. You'll remove all the cards from the board and set up the next set of nine. So we will take this A deck and flip out nine more cards. You'll change the events from ones to the other, and you'll also reveal what the next round's event is going to be. So in this current round, players will have the opportunity to pay one money to untap and retap a building to get its benefit twice. If the building requires any cost, you still pay them, but this can be great, especially for victory point cards and things that give you free Spirium. As I said at the beginning of a round, each player will collect their income. So blue would collect two and green would collect three. And then we'll take a gander at nine more cards. And of course I have the wrong deck. Let's try that from the A backed cards. So you would see nine more. And the first player token would pass to the next player clockwise. This continues all the way up through the last deck. So in the third deck in C, a lot of buildings don't have any additional benefits but are a very good ratio of victory points to money. So six for six, eight for nine, and there's even a beautiful 10 for 12. And then you'll see the characters are a little more, this guy, you just use him and grab three victory points. You've got Spirium for victory points and some Spirium in case you needed some for in-game scoring. So now that we had a chance to see the gameplay, let's talk a little bit about what I thought, and I'd love to hear your comments down below. Uh, Spirium for me is a solid 7, 7 out of 10. It is great, it scales from 2 to 5 rather well, it even plays it to rather well. It's got the Scrooge factor, it's got incentivizing you to take less good actions, to kind of F with other people. It values victory points from turn one and it also allows you to make really cool engines and there's definitely a few different ways to win the game. Uh, components wise it uses those little green crystals, those are fabulous. Uh, the meeples are fine as I said. Uh, I would, I don't see why when cubes couldn't have been your scoring markers, why the discs the cards are linen finish, which it's fine. They lie on the table flat. They could have actually just been not, but that's okay. Uh, really no no downsides. A little fiddly, I guess. Um, kind of putting bits all over the place in the different decks. Uh, the events, we all felt we could have had early, mid, or late game events, or even early and late game events. Some of them are strictly about getting you another meeple, getting you some extra stuff, and some of them allow you to retap built buildings and doing things that you really won't be doing in the first round or two. Uh, overall, I'm super psyched to have another William Adia in my collection. That being said, I really hope it doesn't take another seven years to, to make a game. Uh, I will be very excited to give Steffenfeld a run for his money on my shelf. He's definitely taking up a large chunk, and I'd like to find another couple reliably amazing designers for my collection. Uh, that's all for now. If you want to visit my website, it's maggiebot.com. I've got other reviews, news, and stuff up, up there, hopefully a little more often. And I will see you all later. Bye!